Hello, 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 and welcome once again to Movies That Pop. I'm the Colonel. Let's see what popped up in theaters this week. <laughs> I did not see this coming, ladies and gentlemen. The trailers for this one made it seem like so much fun, especially compared to the DC films that preceded it, that I was really looking forward to this. But virtually from the jump, Suicide Squad establishes itself as a loud, confounding mess that only occasionally shows flashes of cool, underwritten, virtually incomprehensible, lacking in focus, and without much of a plot to speak of. I mean, what else is there to say? While Suicide Squad represents a clear attempt to make DC movies fun again and correct the mistakes of Batman v Superman and Man of Steel before it, all it does is make a slew of brand new mistakes instead. That's it for the capsule review. Now let's get in depth. Now, watching Suicide Squad is akin to um, eating out of the dumpster of a five-star restaurant. Sure, there's actually some good stuff in there, but it's neither a well-rounded meal nor presented with any sort of order, and you have to excuse and ignore a lot of things that make you gag in order to get through it. Taking up after the events of Batman v Superman and containing cameos from a couple of members of the Justice League as well, Suicide Squad lets you know the kind of storytelling you're in for right away as Viola Davis's character, Amanda Waller, more on her later, sits down at a dinner table with some government muckety-mucks and details her plan. She goes through the list of killers that she wants to hire, and we stop for flashbacks, introducing each one of the team. And some of those flashbacks admittedly are pretty fun and get the movie rolling right away. Oh, but the flashbacks are clearly weighted towards the characters who are more important. Will Smith's Deadshot gets an intro for a full five minutes, whereas Slipknot, played by Adam Beach, well, he literally shows up a minute before the team leaves for their mission and gets one sentence explaining his abilities. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So Waller sits down and in 20 full minutes of screen time explains who each member of her team is over dinner. Then in the very next scene she goes to like the Pentagon or something where she sits with a whole other different group of generals and she explains the exact same thing. But wait, it gets worse. At one point she introduces this doctor played by Cara Delevingne and says that just as she planned it, she and this military guy Rick Flagg fell in love. Wait a minute, she planned for them to fall in love? Really? Well, this is not the first time Waller's plans seem completely ludicrous, and it won't be the last. In fact, her plans are right up there with Lex Luthor's master plan in Batman v Superman. Once this team of reluctant heroes, in fact the word reluctant is really an understatement, and the word heroes is sort of an overstatement, is assembled, we are introduced to the villain of the film, which is maybe one of the biggest problems any comic book movie can have. Not that this can't be overcome, Marvel does it all the time. But, best I can figure it, there's this ancient witch that opens some kind of space hole in the sky over Midway City, which gets completely evacuated, and the Suicide Squad, which again, is made up of a bunch of misfits who don't have any chemistry, guardians of the galaxy they are not, and have varying levels of weak motivations for lending a hand, although Deadshots is the strongest and the best. Just gets launched into this abandoned metropolis with a bunch of commandos to take her out by, uh, well, it's not really clear what they're planning. And that is the movie's biggest problem. It doesn't make any sense. The reasons for assembling this specific group, only a couple of them who even have superpowers, to fight monsters doesn't make sense. The characters' various story arcs and decisions don't track very well, and it's very difficult to tell what people are planning to do and why at every given moment. There was one point where the squad burst in to rescue someone from a building that, heck, I didn't even know that person was in there, or that rescuing that person was part of the plan, or that that person even needed to be rescued. I can't tell you whether Waller is a noble anti-hero or a detestable villain. And no, that's not deliberate ambiguity. That's just sloppy writing. I don't fully understand the relationship between Joker and Harley Quinn. Is she a normal person who was hypnotized, brainwashed, and pretty brutally abused by a charismatic psychopath? Or is she a psycho who just came out of the closet when she finally met her match? I'm inclined towards the former, and that sort of makes their entire relationship icky and disturbing, and I just know people will romanticize it. They will try to Bonnie and Clyde this couple because the movie is, just like Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet, clearly being sold on its aesthetic, and their romance is bathed in color and fashion and shiny as chrome. Which leads me to what I liked about the film. It does have a unique look, however intentionally manufactured by a big corporation, it is designed to death, and it will probably sell a lot of merch at Comic-Con and Hot Topic. There is more fun and humor inserted into this one than previous DC movies. Every now and again, someone gets a great character moment, and the movie begins to flutter to life. But such moments are few and fleeting. I'm thinking specifically of one great action beat that Deadshot gets, and a scene inside a bar late in the film where we get some good character work from everyone, culminating in Diablo's backstory which is very well handled, and you start to wonder why he didn't get his big introduction in the beginning along with everyone else. You also wonder why Joker was all over the marketing for this movie, but appears only in a handful of scenes, none of which includes this line from the trailer. I can't wait to show you my toys. 
The reason why it's not in there? Well, because this movie is a slapdash, disjointed mess. That's why this thing reeks of rewrites, reshoots, re-edits, and redundancy. Sure, we get the first big screen live action appearance of fan favorite, especially if you're judging by the amount of cosplayers every year at Comic-Con, Harley Quinn, and she's well played by Margot Robbie. She's fun and flirty and dangerous, but let's be honest, as Femme Fatales go, Black Widow would break this girl in half. Just saying. But the fun that comes along with Harley Quinn and Deadshot and Diablo can't overcome the lack of plot coherence and limp writing enough to warrant a recommendation that you actually see this thing. Small bag of popcorn for this, one of the biggest disappointments of 2016 so far. As for the future of the DC Cinematic Universe from here, well, there's always Wonder Woman. You know, there's, there's that Wonder Woman trailer that, uh, that looked okay, right? For this edition of Movies That Pop, don't forget to follow me, the Colonel, on Twitter, at Movies That Pop. And click the icon right down there to visit our channel. You'll be able to view all of our other videos, and more importantly, click subscribe, so you'll never miss an episode. Please, tell me what you thought of Suicide Squad, or, or sure, if you want, tell me what you think of me personally, just for disliking it, in the comments below. As long as we're civil, guys. Honestly, I don't know why DC Comics fans become the new Raiders fans. And if you enjoyed this review, be sure to give it a click on the thumbs up icon. In the meantime, thanks for watching. I'm the Colonel, and I can't wait to show you all my... Toys.